Still way too far away, it keeps moving back. I'm being really loud though, I'm not being very, very sneaky. So I'm gonna go try to go around the, hold on a sec. That was the other black hawk, flying up there hunting, they're nesting right over there. What's up guys, welcome to, oh shit. <laughs> Let me change hats real quick. Don't mind the crazy hair. <laughs> Whew. That's better. Now I look like some sort of a normal person. <laughs> What's up guys, welcome to another episode. So today I'm out here isolating as per usual now and uh, birding. Birding I find really helps keep my sanity I'm lucky that I live in a place like this, like this is my backyard kind of, my house is like right over there. So just being able to walk in this stuff and creeks and mountains and deserts. Hope you guys are staying safe out there. Hope you guys are binging YouTube content creators. <laughs> Anyways, rambling, sorry. Uh, so I bought this recently. Uh, if you've been following my Instagram or anything, you probably know, I bought the Canon RP. And I bought it for not, obviously not wildlife. Um, I bought it as a vlogging camera and a YouTube camera so I can actually film stuff like this. Although right now I'm using my 5D4 still. And I'm most importantly, I bought it as a uh, time-lapse camera because this has a built-in intervalometer. And anyways, I'm a time-lapse photographer also. I need another time-lapse camera. I wanted to get into mirrorless. So I bought this and I also figured it'd be fun just to have for uh, everything else, just a third backup camera. But uh, since I've been doing more birding lately and coming out here and walking around and I just haven't wanted to carry my 1DX2, I just figured I would give this guy a shot and see if, uh, if it's even possible to bird with it or to do wildlife photography with it. A lot of people, you know, th this definitely isn't designed as a wildlife camera. I think everybody knows that by now. And I don't think anybody uh, would really even consider this. And I'm definitely not telling you to consider it, but what I'm saying is if you have it, or if you're thinking about getting it uh, for whatever other reason, you know, it has great autofocus, has great IAF, has great portrait camera, landscape camera, uh, great travel camera, all that stuff. Although travel's not too huge in the world right now, <laughs> but it will be again. But the point is, if you have this and you wanna get into wildlife photography, I wanna see if that's possible and see if you could actually still get some decent stuff with it. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about my experiences. I've had it for about a week or so. Well, I've had it for a few weeks and I've been taking it out every single morning, every single evening uh, for the past probably 10 days at least and uh, birding with it, wildlife photography with it, all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna talk about the pros and the cons. So there's a few pros and there's probably a lot of cons. So I'm gonna try to go over them. I'm not gonna just completely bash it or anything like that. I try not to be overly negative. So the cons that I'm gonna talk about, hopefully uh, there's, we'll talk about some, how I'm dealing with those. Let's start off with the biggest, the two biggest pros out there. Uh, size, I mean, it 
it basically looks like a little nub off of my, my lens. It's ridiculous how small and light it is. So that is super nice to not have to like completely wreck my back, my shoulders, my arms, all that. Carrying around my 1D all the time. Size is great. Let's talk about the grip real quick. A lot of people are complaining about the grip, especially people with larger hands, larger people like me. After walking around with it for a week or so, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, yeah, if I do this, then my pinky definitely hangs off. But what I do is I hold the pinky up here and then I have my forefinger up here because it's usually up here anyways. And that gives me a pretty solid grip. So I haven't had any issues with that. Also, this, this actual grip is really great for what it is. It's very similar to the R, just a little bit smaller. It really, uh, it really protrudes right here and gives even a larger hand a lot of grip. So uh, even though you know it's not big enough for all four fingers of mine to grip it, the fingers that do grip it, it's really solid. So I haven't had any issues with that. I've actually found it pretty comfortable for uh, just hand holding, walking around. Even I don't have a strap yet. I gotta get a new strap. Um, so even just walking around for hours like that and just being able to hang it off of this, I've never felt like it's gonna slip or fall or uh, like it's too uncomfortable for whatever. So I personally don't have a problem with that. So next biggest advantage, of course, is price. This thing is like a thousand bucks. I actually got it used on eBay for like 850 bucks or something. So I actually got a pretty good deal on it. And mine actually came with three extra batteries and a dual battery charger. Uh, you know, it's always be careful when you're buying on eBay and stuff. But I took the risk. I know the risk. I took it. Uh, and I'm very happy that I did. But then I had to buy the adapter separate and I found that on eBay too for a um, hundred bucks, I think. This is the one without the control ring, so that is a bummer, and we're gonna get to that in a minute. But overall, I definitely, this is very similar to the EOS R, and if you guys, if you have an R or if you're interested in the R, I also did a video about wildlife photography with the R. You can check that out right here, and a lot of the same stuff, positives and negatives, are gonna go with that, uh, are gonna be very similar in here. And I'm gonna talk about some of the things that I set up and some of the ways that I set this camera up to get the most out of it for my wildlife. So let's talk about specs real quick. 26.2 megapixel full frame sensor. I think that's another big draw is it's kind of, it's kind of middle of the road for megapixels. You know, it's not as much as the 5D4, but more than some of the crop cameras, like the old 18 megapixel sensors, full frame. And that's, that's a, to me, I know a lot of wildlife photographers still probably prefer uh, crop bodies. And I've done multiple videos on, you know, what gear I recommend and all that stuff. And I've done, I've talked about this a lot. So if you want to check out some of my other wildlife videos in the playlist or whatever, you should. Uh, so I don't have to go too much into that, but suffice it to say, I love full frame, even for wildlife, because I'm at the point to where I would rather have uh, a cleaner image and I can shoot at higher ISOs and all of that. And I'll, I would rather have that than a little extra reach from the crop, you know? So I, I really enjoy that this is full frame, 26 megapixels. Of course, I wish there was more, but it is enough. And I found that um, all of these images that I'm showing you guys, uh, over the course of this video have been cropped between 50 and 85 percent and on, on this sensor and that, that's pretty impressive to me that uh, I'm still able to get such usable images out of that with such a heavy crop and a mediocre uh, megapixel count. So that's the sensor. I would definitely say too that it's not as good even though it is full frame it's not as good at high ISO obviously as my 5D4 or my 1DX2. Uh, but I have shot, I think, I think I've shot up to ISO 6400 and maybe even a couple shots at 8000 out here. And with a little bit of noise reduction, I think especially for uh, social media type stuff, they are usable. I probably wouldn't print them super big, especially having to crop in. But uh, I would definitely say for just normal, casual birding photography, wildlife photography uses and social media, that it's definitely usable, especially when you can go into Photoshop and do some denoising and, and really clean up the images and make them a little bit more acceptable. All right, so let's talk about controls for a minute. This is probably another downside. This thing does not have a lot of intuitive 
uh, controls or easy to use setup controls. Now you can custom stuff. I first thing I did was I did back button focusing. Uh, so I put the, the back button focus back here to the star and I'm glad you can still do that. The second thing that I did was I turned on the uh, touch function and enabled it to the touch and drag so that it's just like the R so that I can use my thumb and drag the point wherever I want. And that helps most of the time. But there's no, uh, there's no immediate buttons for being able to control aperture and ISO and stuff. And that's why I said I prefer the control ring, the adapter with the control ring. Uh, even though I didn't get it, I will get it at some point because I am planning on getting some more mirrorlesses. I will get the R5 and the R6 when they come out. But for now, I only have this regular one and that leaves one less customizable uh, adjustable thing. I would have liked to put the aperture, the ISO, something right there. So you can customize like these little, I think you customize this thumb wheel and that might help a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck to using the back of the screen and basically just uh, swiping and that's fine uh, for most things. But when you're on the fly and, and you want to change stuff fast, it makes it a little difficult. So you, you go in here and change the aperture as well. and that's just not uh, not always convenient. So it's just a little bit slower than like my other cameras, the 5D4, the 1DX2, that kind of stuff, traditional DSLRs that have those control rings built in. Although the customization is there to an extent, uh, especially if you have that control ring, that would help a lot. So how I get around that is for my wildlife stuff, I definitely just try to set it and forget it for the scenario. So I usually put it in auto ISO, uh, especially I'm more comfortable with that going up to the full frame cameras or using the full frame cameras because I know if the ISO shoots up that I'm okay with that, I'll be able to deal with it. If I was on a crop body and I put it in auto ISO, I would maybe limit it to you know whatever I felt like the ISO would cap out at. So I would tell it it could be an auto ISO but only up to 6400 or only up to 3200 or something. That way uh, the crop sensors, the sensors that can't handle that as well would be all right. But for this, I put it in auto ISO. I don't worry about the limit because uh, I know I can deal with it. And then I put it in manual mode and I just set my aperture manually. I, uh, depending on the weather, I will, if it's like today, this morning, it was real cloudy and now it's getting sunny. So if it's real cloudy and drab and I'm in the forest or in some more dark areas or whatever, then I'll just open it up as wide as possible. But when it gets sunny and it gets nice outside, like it is most of the time here in New Mexico, and I have bright daylight. Oh, there's a towhee right there. He's looking at me. <laughs> and I have super bright daylight and all that stuff, then I will definitely switch it to F8 or even F11 to get more depth of field for my birding shots. And I'll just leave those there. That way, uh, I, that's less to fiddle with. The only thing I'm really messing with is shutter speed. So that'll help a lot. And then I also, uh, if it's cloudy or I'm shooting backlit or whatever, I will also mess with the exposure compensation. And that on here is on the touch screen too. And that's, again, that's one of those things that like on my 5D and my 1D, I have exposure compensation buttons and I can quickly do that. So I usually set it to like two thirds plus two thirds and then forget about it. That way, if it's a little over, I can drop the highlights in post. And if it's a little under, I can still boost the shadows and have some detail there. But there's no, you'd have to set a custom thing for that if you want it, either like on this dial or the control ring, you can set for exposure compensation. If you have like auto ISO or if you're in aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode or something like that. So let's talk about another one of the most important factors for wildlife and that's auto focusing. So how does this do, well, two things. So we're talking about frame rate and auto focusing. So frame rate on this thing uh, is not great. I don't even know what it is actually. I'll put it up here if I check, but it's definitely bottom of the barrel in terms of frame rate. Uh, the buffer also is not as good as my 1DX2, of course, uh, that's to be expected. However, if you put a really high quality card in here, so I've got the SanDisk Extreme, uh, Extreme Pro 170 meg per second card, uh, and it doesn't get those speeds either, but it gets close, I guess. And the right speeds I've found, I've been able to shoot maybe 20 or 30 or so uh, shots, and then in the buffer will will hit um, 
if you're with this, if you're shooting and you're looking in the EVF and you're just holding down and spraying, I find that the blackout is is pretty decent or the lack thereof, the lack of the blackout. Uh, I had I had a lot of trouble with that with the R. And for some reason, I don't seem to be having as much trouble with the blackout with the RP. And some another commenter on one of my other, the R video, for wildlife videos uh, was kind enough to, uh, to let me know that the EF lenses cause more of a blackout than the native RF lenses. And I don't know how true that is because I've never used the RF lenses yet. So maybe that's something and maybe that will also be the same with this, like when they release a actual wildlife lens, like an RF uh, super zoom or something, maybe that will be a much better choice. Obviously it'll be a better choice because you won't have this, this uh, extra ring here. So blackout's not that bad, but when you're looking through here and you're spraying and praying and you're uh, shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting, it's cool and it shows it in the EVF. And then as soon as you let it go, that's when the blackout kicks in and it just like stops for a second or two. Uh, and then if you try, and if you go back to shooting, it, it'll it still stall, it'll still wait, there'll still be the blackout period. Uh, and then by then your subject, your bird, your animal, whatever could be gone. And that's happened to me quite a bit actually, is I'll be shooting a bird like this and then I'll shoot, 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 shoot. And then I'll just release for a second to make sure I you know recompose or whatever and then big old blackout, and then, you know, the bird will just fly off. And, and I won't even have noticed it because if you're looking in the EVF, then you're seeing what it's showing you, you know, the either the blackout or the image or whatever. And you can turn the image review off, which I definitely do. So I turned it off in the R and then I turned it off in this as well, and that'll help. But you still have that blackout period and you'll still have that stall period after you do a burst mode and then try to find the animal again and then it's gone. So also in terms of autofocus, I, I use the same method for pretty much every camera I have. I usually stick to center point uh, or the surrounding nine uh, if it's like bird and flight stuff. And for like deciduous stuff like this in the woods and, and uh, there's lots of tree branches and everything, then I definitely stick to a center point and then put that where I want it. And then uh, I think that has been the easiest way to assure that I'm gonna get solid, fast focus. Weather sealing, let's talk about that real quick. Uh, obviously, I keep saying this, uh, I just, because people keep asking me to compare, but it definitely doesn't compare to my 5D or my 1DX2, but it is weather sealed. The, the adapter, both the adapter, when I rented this from Lens Rentals a while back, I rented the, well, I rented the R and I rented the adapter with the control ring. So both that adapter and this regular, this is the cheapest adapter that Canon has, the, the bare bones one, but they are both weather sealed. They both have the O-ring right here. And then if you have a weather sealed lens like this one, then it is weather sealed from this side. So that's weather sealed. And then the body itself is weather sealed enough so far, I mean, I live in New Mexico. I have like 330 days of sunshine a year, but I, I was out one time a few, like a couple weeks ago actually, and it started sprinkling and raining while I was doing a time-lapse with the RP and I had that sitting out and I let it go and it was fine. So it, I can attest that at least it can handle like a mild sprinkle and just a normal rain. Uh, would I go out with it in a downpour like I would with my 1D? Probably not. Uh, well, definitely not. But it is weather sealed to some extent, and that does make me feel a little bit better. Just in general, you know, I live in the desert anyways, and I'm always dealing with dust and all that stuff. So I'm going to go over real quick a few things that I changed, and I've already talked about some of them. I'm not going to go detail into this video, but let me know in the comments below if you guys want to see a step-by-step -step detailed video of how I set this up for mirrorless. If I get enough interest, maybe I'll do that. First thing, back button focus. I already have a video about how to do that. You can check that out right here. And that's with the Canon cameras. It's pretty similar. The menu system's a little different, but it's still basically the same. So you can figure out how to do that. Um, and if I make the other video, then obviously I'll do a step-by-step. -step. Touch and drag shutter. So where I have it to be able to focus the right half of the screen using my thumb. I set that up, I enable that. Uh, shoot in raw, I always shoot in raw. So I all, that's the first thing I do change that to raw turn off the noise reduction thing in camera uh, and also because I shoot with some of the third-party lenses and this might not be much of an issue anymore but I think it kind of was before it was turning off the like lens corrections and all that stuff with the lenses I think that'll help 
it might help minutely focus things a little bit faster and have a little bit better response time and all that. So I just turn it off anyways because I can do that stuff in uh, Photoshop or whatever, in Lightroom, Camera Raw, whatever you use, uh, you should be able to do that. I turn off the beep, that's a huge thing for wildlife. That's the, I, I do that for every camera no matter what. I don't like to hear the beep when you have autofocus, it beeps. Uh, I don't like that, so I turn that off immediately. Oh, and then I up the brightness on the LCD because if you're using this LCD screen, uh, I, I use it about half and half. So I turn up the brightness on that for sure because uh, daylight, you want it as bright as possible. Usually it's gonna drain your battery a little bit. So on the, yeah, let's talk about battery. That's a good segue. <laughs> so battery life on this thing, obviously it sucks. So, I mean, this is your battery. I mean, come on, you know, like, I mean, I have three of these and I'll use all three of them in a day easily. And if I, ha I probably will buy more still because they're so tiny and just to have them uh, more. So when you're doing just regular photography though, even wildlife, um, I find that maybe after a couple of hours, I've gone through a battery and a half. And because the LCD screen is on all the time and the EVF is on all the time, the LCD screen, if you're just walking around and having it on and you're just, you know, walking around, then the LCD screen will turn off after a little bit. And you might be able to, in the settings, control when and how long that turns off, uh, when it times out, I don't know. But I usually, if I'm just walking to a place and, and whatever, I'll just flip it around. That way it'll, it'll uh, turn off because you'll feel it when you're walking and you're kind of just walking around, you'll feel the autofocus is just constantly hunting and the screen is just always looking and all that. So I flip the screen around and I turn that, you know, that way and then it'll time out. And then uh, if I need to, then you just wake it up by half pressing and looking in the EVF. So that's another thing is it doesn't wake up super fast. That's kind of the benefits of the OVF over the EVF is it, it definitely takes a second to wake up and sometimes that second is a missed shot. You know, if a bird flaps right in front of you and you get it out and then it takes, you know, a second or two to wake up and then a bird flies off, well, you just missed that shot. So that kind of sucks. And then, like I said, all that stuff with the EVF always being on and then if your LCD screen is out and open all the time and you're using it a lot more, then that's obviously also gonna contribute to, and if you pump up the brightness like I do all the way, all of that's gonna contribute to more battery use. And then with AI servo and burst mode, if you're doing that a lot, all that stuff, again, is going to also increase battery drainage pretty quickly. So I've definitely noticed that, you know, an hour to two hours and of, of constant shooting and I'm, de I'm definitely on my second battery by then. And video is something completely different. I'm not gonna talk about video in this, but I will make a separate review about video and how all of that stuff is affected and the things that I change and all of that. But video will definitely drop your battery life a lot faster, obviously. So let's talk about a couple of uh, unscientific things real quick. And that's, I say that because uh, I haven't scientifically tested them, but they're things that I kind of feel. And the first thing definitely is autofocus. So I feel like having used this and having used the R and having used the 5D4 and the 1DX2 and 7D Mark II and all that other stuff, I feel like this is definitely one of the uh, slower autofocusing cameras that I have. And I feel like I have missed a few shots that I wouldn't have or that I would have been able to nail with the other cameras, especially the 5D and the 1D. Uh, shots like this where, and this is, I mean, this is a tough shot anyways. It's like, you know, this Tohi has just popped his head right out from the thing and it's already so far away. It's already too far away that you have to crop in anyway. So at that point, it's really hard to tell on the back of the screen, you know, without magnifying in. And then you see that you just barely missed focus just a little bit. It hit the tree and not the tohi. And that's really hard because the focus box is bigger than the tohi at this point. So, and then it's right on the tree and it wants to just grab that tree. So I've definitely got shots like that. And that that's not so much the camera as like, I should have tried to get closer or whatever, you know, but in wildlife getting closer is not always possible. And I, I mean, obviously I take, you know, the right, the proper, uh, effort and uh, dress in camo and I have a ghillie suit right here if I really wanted to you know get into it then I could just throw the ghillie suit on and sit down and throw some feet out and just wait and have the birds come closer to me but without doing that stuff just casual wildlife photography uh, especially with only a 400 millimeter 
lens on a full frame that it sounds like a lot to people who don't do this very often or you know haven't gotten into wildlife but 400 on a full frame is just even especially for these little flappy birds it's just not enough uh, I would definitely prefer to have the Tamron 150 to 600 and I actually did a review on that with the R so you could probably check that out too if you want to see like what that what I think of that lens but spoiler alert I think it's pretty darn good for the money um, so I would I would actually prefer to have a little bit of extra reach in the lens and that'll help a little bit with uh, with stuff like that because the closer you can get to something the easier it's going to be to focus on them and when they're so far away that you know you're going to have to crop in 50, 60, 80, 100 percent you know then the chances of you nailing focus on something that far away are even harder but all that being said uh, even with my 1DX2 and my 5D4 I have that problem to an extent but I still just feel like the focus is it's slower to acquire and you can adjust that there's focus speed for adjusting how fast it locks on and how fast it stays on and I'm gonna have to adjust that and I may make a separate video on that as well but just right out of the box uh, just using it in general I still feel like even with some of those adjustments it's a little bit slower locking on or uh, it, or w slower with its hunting. And that's maybe caused me to miss a few shots. And I definitely wouldn't, uh, I definitely wouldn't discount user error because even though I am a professional photographer and I'm, you know, doing wildlife for decades now, I, it's still something that, you know, user error is always gonna be there when the human element is involved. So that definitely could be on my part also. Uh, and it's also just on the part of physics where, you know, things are small and really far away. It's going to be hard for any camera to really nail focus, especially if you're going to have to crop in. But with all that being said, I still feel that the autofocusing system in this guy is not quite up to par compared to even the EOS R. I felt like the R, uh, it had a lot of the same problems as this does, you know, with the, the mirrorless and the the lack of a lot of features and all that but the autofocusing as a whole i think i missed less shots with the r over a week or two with that than i have with this but again you can change that and i'm not here to bash this and i'm also not here to say that you shouldn't try wildlife with this if this is what you have that's kind of the main takeaway from this is no matter what you have, you can do wildlife photography and there are going to be some drawbacks. There's always going to be better cameras and better lenses and all of that stuff, but that stuff will only help you so much. Stuff like this, I mean, stuff like this, this shirt was $4 at Walmart. I got it on sale $4 at Walmart. This little hoodie thing that I wear, uh, that, that was like $10 on Amazon. This ghillie suit, that I have right here that I keep stuffed in my cargo. Uh, definitely the wrong color for New Mexico, but it still works. It still does well. This was like uh, 20 bucks or 30 bucks maybe. It, it wasn't that much, you know? Stuff like that, um, a portable blind, you know, a little bit of bird seed. Technique is what I'm trying to say here. Technique and the effort that you're willing to put into it. That kind of stuff, no matter what gear you have, will help you get better wildlife photography learning the wildlife in general learning it's learning the wildlife habits whatever wildlife you're tracking whether it's foxes or birds or deer or you know whatever squirrels learn their habits learn about them and what they do and where they are and, and all of that stuff that kind of stuff will help your wildlife so much more than gear and I've been really happy overall, I've said a lot of negative stuff in here, but overall, I still have been able to take this out every day and know that for the most part, I'm gonna be able to get some good stuff. And yeah, I've missed some stuff, but I always miss stuff, you know? And that's always gonna happen. But at the end of the day, I feel like if you have this or you want this and you want to get into wildlife photography, do not let the paper specs and what other people say, oh, you can't do it because of blah, blah, blah. Yes, you can. You know, I think I've proved that over the last week. I think I've gotten a lot of great shots and all the shots that I've shown you guys, all of the, the birding shots from this, uh, none of that is none of that is from a blind none of that is baited none of that is with food none of that even i haven't even used my ghillie suit yet uh to it's just in some camo walking around in the forest and being sneaky and being patient so just casual wildlife photography 
yes, you can do it. And the more effort you put into it and the more you learn about photography and wildlife in general, the better all of that's gonna stuff's gonna get even with a subpar wildlife body. So that's the takeaway. I know I rambled a lot, but uh, in these times of isolation and social distancing and viruses and all of that, quarantining, I mean, hopefully this uh, 20 to 30 minute video was enjoyable for you because you might not have too much else to do right now. <laughs> and if you're watching this in the future and all of that stuff is past, well then that's fantastic. So hopefully you enjoyed it anyway. If you have any questions about anything that I went over or didn't go over concerning how this performs for the wildlife photography, leave those in the comments below and I will definitely answer them. Hit that like button if you enjoy this video. Subscribe if you haven't already. I've got new videos every week. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one. I am going to go hunt that black hawk now because I have heard it multiple times while filming this video. So let's go find us a black hawk, shall we? Well, you've probably already seen the images. <laughs> all right, see, oh, there's those, all those mallards, you hear them? <laughs> they just crash landed right in that tiny little creek pond. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Maybe I'll go stock them too and see what I can get. <laughs>